It's uh, very good to be here and thanks for the welcome and the introduction. Um, it feels like I'm coming home a bit because uh, not only is it close to my home territory, Ganawage, Ottawa, but uh, I spent a lot of time in Ottawa working in the 90s and uh, every time I come to Carleton or University of Ottawa, they're always so well organized and so welcoming. I just wanted to thank Naomi and the students for inviting me. It's mm -hmm. great to be here and uh, thank you all for coming out, fighting through the traffic. The blockade that they had of our university. <laughs> they must have heard that I was coming, so they had a blockade. And so, no, nah, it's uh, we came in by the back door, so we had no problem. <laughs> so, yeah, it's great to be here, and uh, especially talking about um, the subject that I was asked to talk about today. Uh, really close to my heart right now in terms of what I'm trying to do in my own work, my own life, and uh, in the work that I do at the University of Victoria with the students, some of whom are here. Who I'll be pointing to uh, in my talk uh, about defining and really elaborating and bringing to life this concept of resurgence. So we start to hear about it a lot and I had um, some of you may know Professor John Burroughs, um, law professor John Burroughs, he's an Anishinaabe, he's at the University of Victoria too uh, in my class last week and uh, we were talking about his work and my work and a lot of people see us as kind of like frenemies, the opposite sides and <laughs> Uh, adversaries or nemeses, I don't know what the proper terminology be, would be, but we do get along quite well uh, even though we have different approaches and uh, different ideas in a lot of ways, but we both got on the idea of resurgence and uh, I have to give him credit because uh, his book uh, way back when it was when it came out, I believe it was in, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, his Remaking Canada book uh, was before my book was Saze and he used the terminology of resurgence. And so people have been using the, the idea of resurg the concept of resurgence for quite a while now. And in the, in the last few years, of course, it's become, um, I'll say this, like a paradigm, uh, an approach, uh, a school even, uh, within academia and even outside of academia in the way that people think about what they're doing with their lives and in politics. And, uh, it's a, good t it's a good space here to reflect on that because you're all either students or professors or researchers or people who obviously have a uh, commitment to taking these ideas forward in the context of community. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next hour and a half of uh, not only outlining where my thinking is on that, but the dialogue that we're going to have because we uh, left a lot of time, unless I run on. Uh, as is known to happen with academic speakers. Uh, we left a lot of time for the, that dialogue, question and answer afterwards. So, um, What I'm going to start with is talking about what I understand as uh, the essence of what resurgence is. Because if the, if the focus of tonight is supposed to be research as Indigenous resurgence, uh, we better start with defining the main concept first of all. So when we talk about resurgence, um, I've been trying to understand and elaborate this for the last uh, 10 years because uh, when I started doing this, actually more than 10 years, um, probably 13 years or so, because when I started, when I was on my academic uh, journey and trying to understand what the essence of the problem is that's facing our people and our societies, like all of you, I kind of went through different stages and different phases of understanding corresponding to my experience, where I was working, the kind of people I was interacting with and so forth. And around about 2001, 2000, after my book uh, Peace, Power, Righteousness came out and I started thinking and talking about that, um, I started to realize that there was some deficits in my understanding and some uh, gaps in what I understood to be uh, colonization and decolonization. And so I started to investigate a little bit deeper as to what the impacts of history, what the impacts of all of the things that we know are problems in our relationship were on people. And then that led me to kind of reevaluating the solutions that have been put forward uh, intellectually and then as they translated into politics as well. So this book that I did in 99, Peace, Power, Righteousness, was kind of a, for those of you that have read it and used it, um, it's kind of a slam on all the leadership in indigenous uh, communities. Uh, it, it comes from a real authentic place as to, uh, related to where I was at that time, working in communities, uh, working in Ganawage, working in, con in uh, the context of the AFN and negotiation politics and so forth. And so the, the gist of that book is trying to hold leaders accountable um, to principles, um, values, and really an indigenous ethic 
of leadership. And um, what I found was that it's real easy to criticize, to try to hold people accountable uh, based on a set of values or principles, but it's real difficult to come up with an alternative for today uh, that's rooted in those values that really make sense and is, a, is an effective vehicle for leadership and politics in our communities. And so uh, that's what I turned to after that book. And so since really 2001, my own academic intellectual journey has been trying to understand and to elaborate and offer to students and then in the sense that we as intellectuals do it in public, offer an alternative vision for people to channel their energy um, in confronting colonialism and rebuilding our nations. And so the book that I produced after that uh, was really a conversation with people who I thought embodied uh, the alternative. So if I was pointing out, oh, problems with the BC treaty process, uh, AFN leadership, you're all corrupt, and uh, all this kind of stuff, you know, kind of the flavor of that book, um, saying you should be more like our Ungwe Hongwe uh, leaders and uh, old school kind of uh, chiefs that we used to have and clan mothers and kind of dialogue that I was having at that time. Um, I went around and thought, well, who are the people, if there's any, in, uh, in Native communities that do embody that uh, alternative? which isn't really an alternative, which is really the true indigenous way, you know, the way of being uh, of our people. And so that's where that book Wasaze comes from. It's uh, traveling around talking to people and really engaging with people on that question. And uh, some of them were recognized leaders, but uh, a lot of them were not. They were people who, when you went into a community and talked to people about these problems, there was kind of a consensus that people would point to them and say, oh, you got to go talk to her. You know, you ought to go talk to uh, Shimina. She's the one who's upholding uh, the way it should be for our nation. She's doing the kind of things that need to be done. In every community, there's those people. Everybody knows that. Eh? So we talked to, that, talked to them, had those conversations, and developed, uh, I'd say, the essence of this idea of what resurgence was, which was really uh, an idea that if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be a scholar, if you're just going to be indigenous, you have, to, you have to look at the situation that you're facing and be honest and look at your relationship to it and look at what it's going to take to change you, to change your community, and to change the relationship to the land. And so the, the essence of being uh, part of a resurgence movement comes out of that kind of feeling. Um, it's rooted, it's accountable, and it's transformative. And when I came up with this, those three principles, I realized the acronym is RAT. <laughs> and uh, I was so disappointed. It didn't have a very powerful acronym, RAT. But then I realized, hey, I'm kind of in Algonquin Ojibwe country and, you know, the muskrat, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so I thought I'd go with RAT anyway. So uh, rooted, accountable, and transformative. And, when you're talking about yourself as an indigenous scholar, when you're a student, thinking about where you're gonna go with your career, and if you're an indigenous leader, or an indigenous person trying to raise up indigenous kids to be more indigenous than you as they go forward in their life, those are the three things that I think define the difference between resurgence and the other alternatives out there for what decolonization and colonization is. Basically, recognition, politics, and, hate to say it, reconciliation. You know, because reconciliation in the era of Trudeau mania and the, the overwhelming popularity of the idea of assimilation and, and so forth is, uh, I realize I might be an outlier here criticizing reconciliation, especially in Ottawa, in Ottawa in the era of Trudeau mania. Um, <laughs> but what the hey, I got the shirt on, so I might as well, uh, <laughs> I might as well take my position and defend it, you know. Uh, so I'm looking forward to a dialogue on that. But when it comes to it, I have to, I have to point to that too as an alternative. And for, for those of you that haven't read uh, or engaged with the work of uh, Leanne Simpson or Glenn Coulthard, and there's, there's all kinds of people working in resurgence, but I'm naming these people that are sort of taking the lead in publishing and, and are known to represent this perspective. I'll focus on Glenn because his uh, critique really is uh, significant in helping people understand uh, the difference between resurgence and reconciliation and recognition. And I'm not here to criticize those two, although I do those kind of talks sometimes, focus on recognition and reconciliation, but just very quickly to kind of elaborate the difference for those of you that haven't engaged on this yet. 
Um, recognition politics is basically the idea that is driving Aboriginal rights, land claims, and so forth. It didn't start out that way. It started out as a strong nationhood movement to get our land back, to, to have our nations, our laws rec uh, recognized, and to have them enlivened again, and to have them govern our people, and govern the lives of our people. But through process of politics and, and so forth, um, it's come to be a process of uh, recognizing indigenous peoples only to the extent that they conform to the basic ideas of the colonial society. And so what you have is an idea that when you have a land claim or a self-government claim or you're negotiating some kind of agreement or the Supreme Court is considering our presence here and our rights, it's mm. more a recognition of uh, the fact that we are now a part of Canada and a recognition of our fact being here, but not any substantial transformative uh, importance to that decision. And so Glenn Coltart does a really good job of, uh, of elaborating the problems with this. Um, and also, I think, builds on the notion of this idea of co-optation about how uh, Canada has structured the whole relationship, the, the decolonizing relationship in Canada, to make it very enticing for people to want to follow that pathway rather than to stand on the strong principles that our ancestors defended our nations on. And so it's not only intellectually seductive to, to think that, to, to be offered the idea of inclusion, recognition, validation, and so forth, but it's also financially motivated as well in the sense that there's a lot of programming dollars and a lot of money behind the whole process structured into the negotiation of these recognitions. Um, that's, that's one element. I'm not going to focus too much on it. Just in gist, that's what it is. Uh, rec the reconciliation, I think everybody's becoming very familiar with that. I mean, when we talk about reconciliation, it kind of builds on recognition, on that whole structure of recognition and Aboriginal rights and so forth. It's oriented towards inclusion too, but in my reading of reconciliation too, it's Canada's effort to um, assuage the guilt of colonization. It's Canada's effort to turn the page on Canadian history. It's Canada's effort to make the suffering of residential schools the centerpiece of an effort to make us forget that our existence is rooted on the land in nations and that we are collectivities and that there is a vast injustice still present whether or not individuals are compensated or healed from the experiences and the horrible experiences they had in residential school. It's Canada's attempt to make it about cultural uh, survival and healing which are two things which no one is going to complain about and say shouldn't happen but when you stop, when you stop there and you don't talk about the land and you only talk about cultural revitalization and healing, it's a further injustice. Because the root of all of our problems as indigenous people, as we've experienced them growing up in our communities and even in the urban context, is dispossession. I remember when I worked, I've said this many times in public, but I always will every time I talk about this and give credit to Rose Lee Tizia, a Yukon elder from Old Crow who um, used to tell all of us who worked at the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the young people at that time in the 90s, that it's all about the land. It's all about the land. So we were talking then about Aboriginal rights, self-government, the, the origins basically, the nascent idea of reconciliation was hatched in the Royal Commission and all of the discussion forums that we had there and the recommendations that were put forward. And she would always remind us, it's all about the land, like don't forget that. Don't let them convince you that social justice is a substitute for land justice. Don't let them convince you that programming dollars and being accepted and being allowed to dress and sing and do your ceremonies and all that is a substitute for your nation's laws being the laws that govern your territory again. Don't let that happen. And uh, not many of us paid attention at that time and I think that now is the time where if we don't pay attention to that message, everything could be lost for our nations. It's getting to that crucial point where there's so, there's so little left of our nationhood as it manifests in reality on the ground, on the land. Uh, and there's so much of an overwhelming threat of assimilation through laws and cultural being overwhelmed culturally and all of these things happening to our people and our future generations that if we don't pay attention to our connection to the land and our rootedness in it intellectually, spiritually, and physically, uh, we, not, we may not be talking about indigenous nationhood a generation from now. We may not be able to talk about it because it might just be a memory 
for our nations, for our people, for the next generations coming up. So it's imperative of us younger people, especially the younger people, to understand how important and then to begin to live that in a very serious way, even as intellectuals. And so that's where this, that's the spirit behind resurgence. It's kind of looking at the alternative pathways that have been laid out by, by previous generations of people who have honestly and with all the best intentions and with a lot of hard work tried to figure out colonization. You know, I'm not putting down the work that we did in the 90s and I'm not putting down the work that was done in the 80s or, easy, or for most people the work that they're doing now. You know, they are coming at it trying to figure things out and lay out a good pathway for the next generation. But just as much as they're doing that, we sometimes forget that there's people on the other side who have other intentions and other ideas that are very consistent with colonization and racism and all those things, and they're fighting just as hard to make sure their vision prevails. And I think that's the difference. You know, if I think back in the 90s and certainly in the 80s, we didn't trust the government. <laughs> we, sorry, but we didn't trust white people either. <clears throat> we were suspicious and we were standoffish and we were hostile intellectually to the ideas that came from Canadian society because we knew our history and we knew what Canadians wanted from us. That's different now. When I'm in, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, when I interact with people, when I watch the news, when I look at the, the, the general kind of social dynamic in the society, it seems like there's a lot of indigenous people in leadership positions, in the media, intellectually and politically, who actually believe that the government wants a good solution for indigenous people. That wants, they, they want indigenous people to survive as indigenous people. That, that, that's bizarre to me. You know, how, could, how could Canada, as, an as a set of institutions, want indigeneity to continue? Because indigeneity means, to me, and I think to anyone who takes it very seriously, indigenous laws on indigenous territory, indigenous cultural practice in relation to the land and each other. It means fundamental difference, and it means a spirit of interrelationship and cooperation, but not integration. It means being in the way of progress. It means all these things. And so when Canada says that it values aboriginality, I think what it's saying is that it values aboriginal people who want to be aboriginal, but not indigenous. You know the difference? So from my Haudenosaunee people, you want to be Aboriginal but not Ongwenhuwe. And that's a significant thing. I've written about this in Wasaze, but it's become much more clearer to me in the last 10 years because when I wrote that book in 2003 to 2005, I was thinking about it as kind of a warning. Don't go that way. You know, we're still kind of, we know who we are, we have a sense of who we are, we're, we're fighting for our, the revival of our laws and our land back and so forth. But now it seems like that's going against the tide. To me, uh, it looks like we're going against the idea that has come to prevail and become hegemonic in this whole discourse, which is Aboriginalism, as I labeled it in that book, and the idea of Native people taking their place in the larger mosaic of Canadian society, of having a special place, but not having a distinct different set of rights in an existence which is parallel and separate from Canada. That seems to be something of a minority view these days, but not in the resurgence paradigm. <laughs> in the resurgence paradigm, intellectually and politically, it is the center of it. And so when I talk about those three uh, principles, rat, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the rootedness conforms, well the three of them actually conform to an old teaching that I can remember from, the, from that same era in the 90s. Um, it was, uh, we had a forum when we formed our program, the Indigenous Governance Program in Victoria. And when we formed that program, I, I thought, I was a director, and I thought, who do we want to come and lay the foundational set of views for our program? You know, who are the, who are the thinkers? or who are two thinkers that we could get and announce to the university with authority as to what we stand for. And I got uh, Lee Maracle and Simon Ortiz. So hopefully you guys know who they are. I'm sure you know who Lee Maracle is. 
Uh, Simon Ortiz is an Acoma Pueblo philosopher and a poet and a, and a teacher. So those two people, to me, embodied what we were trying to do with iGov. And Lee Maracle did her thing, and you know she talked about the ongoing re realities of colonization, and violence against women, and all of this stuff, and it was great. And that's certainly a, part, a big part of what we do in iGov, too. Um, there's also Simon Ortiz, who's more of a gentle teacher, who brought in the message of uh, land, culture, and community. And he reinforced for the students there, for us who would be teaching in this program and for the university community, what the, importance, what the important things were that we should be focusing on. And just like the Yukon elder, Rosalie Tizia, him again coming and saying, it's land, it's culture, and it's community. And when I think about that rootedness, accountability, and transformation, it kind of conforms to that. Um, if you think about rootedness, it's about the land. If you think about accountability, it's about community. And you think about culture, it's about transformation. We're all colonized. We've all inherited a colonized existence. And maybe I'll start with transformation. We all inherited that. We're all part of it. We've all lived it to one degree or another. The false identities, the colonized, disruptive, harmful notions of masculinity, of gender relationships, of uh, how we treat our bodies and how we live in relation to the land and all these kind of things. You know, we've all, we've all taken that in. No one can escape that. So there's no one that can stand up and say, oh, I'm free from that, or I wasn't affected by it. If they do say that, then you know they're blowing smoke at you and don't believe their teachings. Because the only true stories are stories about transformation, about how someone has come to be awakened to that and then followed good teachers looked at the teachings that are available from within her culture and then committed to making the changes in her life in order to become stronger and to transform herself from that colonized or harmful being into something that is more healthy, powerful, good. And that's not only in the colonial era. We think about uh, the great law, the Gaiyanergo. It's all about transformation too. I recently started writing another kind of a book and stories about Ganawage. And, uh, I reread because I don't speak Mohawk enough to be able to listen to it and get the teachings that way. I could listen a little bit, but I'm reading the material and uh, I start to realize that's all about transformation too. Tarudaho, Ayunwata, it means he's awake. Um, all of these stories and almost every single interaction in the Iroquois Great Law of Peace is about an interaction where someone is doing something wrong or they have a bad mind, Skanigoraksa, and it comes and it gets transformed through the teachings. And then they become the carriers of that wisdom and they become the ones who embody it. And then the community heals. So transformation is at the heart of indigenous resurgence. And I think that's one thing that's forgotten a lot in our business. And our business, I'll say, is academia and politics, where people think that they could have ideas but not live them. And that they can teach ideas but not embody them. Maybe, but I think not. Because think about in your own life, every teacher that you've had, every person that has affected you and caused you to go in a different direction that's a better direction, I won't even say better actually, that's caused you to go in a different direction, even if it's bad. They embody a certain way of being and they affect you and they lead you, either through example or by taking your hand and taking you in that direction. And you're not gonna follow someone who doesn't understand the way that they're teaching implicitly and, and model that and, and display that power in the way that they, they behave towards you, whether it's good power or bad power. And so that's a very important lesson to take and to carry forward and I think to reset our ideas about what it is to be an indigenous intellectual and an indigenous leader in this context of resurgence, that it's not like uh, reconciliation and it's not like reconciliation uh, recognition framework where you can be all up here you know where you can think and you can figure out and you can write and you can read and you can analyze very very powerfully in some cases but not carry it out to your daily life and the way that you live in relation to other people so I think about what we used to do with uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples we used to get together, do research, 
have discussions, write up papers and policy. <clears throat> and in that era, and maybe it, was, maybe it was just me and the crowd I hung out with, but I think it was more general than that. Uh, we didn't think about the implications on our own personal uh, choices so much. So basically, it was all about projecting, projecting a critique. Think about that in academia, how powerful the notion of critique is. You know, it comes from a certain school of thought, but it's generally infused in native studies and all of the things that we do now, the idea of critique. It's great, you take ideas, you take them apart, you contrast them with other ideas and you find their flaws and weaknesses and then you point those out and you try to build something stronger by doing that. And then you go have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> And then you go back to whatever you were doing before you got to that class or that lecture. <laughs> That's not resurgence, you know. And I'm not saying you can't drink if you're in resurgence, certainly not, because I do. But that was just an example of uh, how you don't necessarily relate what you're talking about to what you're doing. And so the transformational process is incredibly important in this idea of resurgence because Basically, what you need to do and what we do in our indigenous governance program is hold the mirror to yourself. And if you're not willing or strong enough to hold that mirror to yourself, we'll hold the mirror up and force you to look in the mirror. <laughs> right? That's what we do in, uh, in IGOV. And uh, just to let you guys know, it's a two-way mirror. Not a two-way mirror, it's a double-sided mirror. Because uh, Professor Corntassel and I, uh, my colleague in doing this and promoting this, uh, it's a two-way mirror because when you're holding it up to Geraldine, you're also looking at yourself and then every year we go through that process of trying to get people to think about this knowledge as transformational, but at the same time, it's actually transforming us as well and how could it not, you know, if we're, if we're involved in that process and trying to lead people in that direction. And so that's, that's the first point about what resurgence is. It's not, a, it's not an academic theory, or if it is an academic theory, it's a new kind of academic theory which demands transformation and a commitment to moving away from where you are on that spectrum of colonization between your home fire and being lost somewhere uh, in that larger society. Wherever you're born along that spectrum, you have to be committed to moving back towards that home fire. Right? And I think that that's the first thing. What are you going to do to make those changes in your life to in, in one way or another at whatever pace you're able to and be comfortable with, move closer and closer. And that's the essence of what resurgence is. And in order for that to happen, you get to the second one, you know, the accountability. Because you're all human beings, so you know that you're capable of rationalizing away just about anything that you do. You know, some of us are better at it than others, but you know, most people are capable of thinking of a reason why they did something and uh, deflecting uh, blame, all of these kind of things. And so generally the smarter you are, and we're all smart because we're in a university here, the smarter you are, the better you are at rationalizing your own misbehavior. Uh, and the better you are and the more sophisticated you are at deflecting blame for you not doing what you're supposed to do. You all know, you're all laughing because you do it all the time and so do I. <laughs> That's why accountability structures are so important. And look at what community means. Community is not just a feel-good term. What is community? When you really are part of a community, it's not all feel-good. It's people judging you. <laughs> it's people poking around in your business. It's people uh, giving you approbation and talking about you behind your back. And it's all that, and it's also holding you up. And it's all the positive stuff, too. That's what accountability is. It's answerability. It's immersion in a real community of people, like a family, to where it's not just you who are thinking through these things and then getting up and giving a lecture and publishing a book or giving a speech and then having all, everybody clap and say, oh, how brilliant you are. You may get that or you may not, but that's not the most important thing, especially from this uh, perspective of resurgence. The important thing is that the accountability structure that you commit to immersing yourself in validates you, corrects you, supports you, and guides you in your work. So that it's not, it's not just an individual pursuit, which is basically, you know, the objective and the framework for scholarly work otherwise. 
Now, scholarly work, you get uh, evaluated, you know, at your various intervals. Um, but other than that, you know, you're in a departmental context or you're in a disciplinary context, you're basically, I think, free to write and say and do what you want. And if you're good at it, as an individual, um, you can basically say and write and do what you want and uh, you can be very, very successful and not have to really answer to anyone other than whether or not it conforms to those scholarly, ethical uh, and scholarly principles of rigorous research and so forth. But in terms of its impact, in terms of its real truth to indigenous communities and its real meaning in indigenous communities, you don't really have to answer to anybody um, as a scholar if you're just working in the normal scholarly context. And so in resurgence framework, that's, that's another key difference, is that you willingly put yourself in that messy situation of uh, community accountability. And I'm not saying there's a one single way to do this or like uh, give you a manual and say, you know, get these kind of people together and this number of people, because no, it's different for everybody. You know, I'm from Gahnawage and I'm uh, a male from Gahnawage. I'm a male of a certain age from Gahnawage. Um, and so forth. So my accountability structure and the needs that I have for accountability and answerability are different than Gahande, you know, and different from other people, Audra Simpson and so forth. You know, everybody's different and so as people you're different too and so you, not, you need basically people that are going to call you on your BS <laughs> is what you need. And accountability structure means you willingly putting yourself in that position and knowing that the only thing that gives your work true value is having that and having those people validate what you're doing and that conforms again to uh, traditional principles it's probably in other nations too but i don't know enough but i know in our tradition when they they wrap you up or they bundle you up and you're an ambassador and you go and you carry a message forward I always think about that, you know, so you, you get the images of getting uh, wrapped up listening to the words of all the women and the men in, in a circle and they're talking and you're, you're kind of bound by that, right? You're, you're bound by it and it's, it sounds like a restrictive or negative thing, but I don't think about it that way. It's, it's a confidence builder, the way I'm looking at it, is that when you're part of that accountability structure, you lay out your ideas, you receive your criticism, you receive your feedback, you receive your, your clarification, and all of these things, and by the time that process is over, not that it's a one-time thing, but in the interaction, by the time you're ready to go out and bring your message forward, you've laid, number one, you've laid it out in front of the hardest audience that you could have. <laughs> so you know that you can go speak to anyone and talk about this and feel confident. But number two, you've, you've received uh, such great teachings in, the, in those interactions that it's also helping you with your research and sharpening it and making it much more powerful as well. So it's not a negative thing to go and put yourself in a community accountability context. It's actually a very positive thing for your work and for your confidence. And so the key in resurgence is as a person who's operating in the context of a university, especially if that university is not situated in the midst of indigenous territories or having such a strong indigenous presence, how do I have that accountability? How do I create that? What kind of connections or what kind of mechanisms do I have in my life and my practice to be able to have that support, that approbation and that confidence that comes from being in that? And that's a real challenge for anybody, you know. And so I think here at Carleton, it's probably easier. You have a strong indigenous presence. There's a lot of indigenous people surrounded by indigenous communities. Anybody who's an indigenous scholar here uh, has a wealth of uh, resources at their disposal. But what about if you're at Yale? <laughs> um, I won't mention my alma mater, Cornell, because there's a strong indigenous presence there and stuff too. Yeah, but what if you're at Yale or Cambridge or um, I don't know, I, I won't pick on any university, but what if you're at one of those other places? Well, then it becomes a lot more difficult. Eh? Like you as an individual then have to develop your own community or devote a significant amount of your resources in terms of time and money traveling to and maintaining that accountability with your home community. And so that I realize is putting a burden on people. It puts a burden, I'm, I'm one that's caught up in that as well. Like I'm Mohawk, but I teach in, uh, on the West Coast and we have our own accountability structures there for the work that we do in this, in this mode. But for my own work, if I'm writing a book about Gantanawage, 
I have to be traveling back to Ganawage and laying out those ideas there and talking to those people and reading it to them and, and getting that kind of feedback there. And uh, that's, that's my commitment and I think that's the commitment of people who are involved in resurgence. So again, um, I could name a bunch of people but I'll focus on the two that I mentioned. So you look at Glenn and the kind of work that he's doing. He's aspiring to be um, embodying this as well as a scholar. So he's involved with building the De Chinta Bush University. He goes up to the Northwest Territories. He's done the moose hunting and not successfully. Sorry, Glenn, but uh, <laughs> not yet, Glenn. <laughs> uh, he's involved in moose hunting and fishing and all that. <laughs> Um, all of that stuff, and so it's a running joke, by the way. I'm not picking on. Uh, <laughs> he's, in, he's involved in that Leanne, Leanne Simpson. You know, uh, I don't correct me if I'm wrong. I believe I don't believe she's teaching at Trent, but she had been, and she's involved in that community and deeply involved in her own nation and so forth. And there's people all over that are doing that. So that's the other element. That's the accountability that conforms to to the community aspect of it. So we have the culture, transformative, we have the community accountability, and then we come to the land and the rootedness in it. I mean, on one level, this should be a real easy no-brainer. It is about the land. Isn't that what we're all fighting for? Isn't that what we all acknowledge as the ultimate goal of the indigenous struggle? You know, Europeans showed up here. We were alienated from our land either by trickery or by... Um, deceit or by treaty or by war or by all these other things you know we we lost our land we were dispossessed for the most part so isn't the native struggle about that and to, to be honest like i said earlier right up until the 90s it was and then it became about something else and um, i'm still at a loss as to understanding why um i don't know why i know for a lot of us it it still is but certainly at the leadership level, it's not a priority at this point. I think that's plainly evident. I think rhetorically it is, but if you look at what people are committed to doing and what they're devoting most of their energy to, uh, it's not about uh, representing our people on the land and having our people make the, that essential connection again for their spiritual and physical health and for the restoration of our nationhood on our land. It's about other things. And so whether or not that has become uh, something that is reflective of a fatigue, like a movement fatigue, you know what I'm talking about? Like we fought for so long, there was such conflict, there was so little progress, the government had active strategies of co-optation, the government has active strategies of uh, what's called legal attrition. You know what that means? Legal attrition, meaning they have way more money and way more lawyers and way more time and plus they are in possession of stolen property. So what's in their interest to solve land claims? Boom, there you got critique of land claims. Right there. They, don't have, they don't have any interest in solving land claims uh, because they can wait us out forever. And I remember people talking about this in the 80s and it's come to fruition actually, you know, because now people are tired of talking about the land. Um, people are tired of talking about conflict. Think about the tone of the reconciliation uh, dialogue that we're having now, whether it's on the Eighth Fire, that TV show from a few years ago, or uh, you know, just the just the general consensus uh, in the mainstream Canadian uh, dialogue, not only among non-native people, but among the native people who are prominent in that dialogue as well. It's time to move on. It's time to move forward. It's time to you know, we need to we need to take advantage. We need to seat at the big table. Remember that? Sorry, Wab Canoe. Uh, sorry, Wab. <laughs> but you said it. You know, so the, the thing is in the, in the Eighth Fire, remember that? Think back a few years. Hopefully everyone's seen the Eighth Fire. If not, you can watch it online. You know? <laughs> so, so here's our friend Wab, you know, walking and trying to do his best at conveying the sense of history. The, the, and then, but it was just so telling, I think, at, at the end, what the objectives of the, I guess, the mainstream perspective on Aboriginality is today, is that, you know, we used to be seated at the kids' table, the little poker table, they had paper, paper plates and all this stuff. <laughs> it was a good image, actually. It was very effective. You know, here, here we have the little kids' table, and then we have the big fancy table with the silver goblets and, I don't know, big candles and scrumptious buffet of foods and stuff like that. And that was it. It was like, we don't want to be at the kids' table. We want to seat at the big table. 
And I understand the, the feeling behind that, of course. Nobody wants to be second class. But think about what that entails as a political objective, uh, especially for indigenous people who claim to be rooted in the land and in our political philosophies that are about respect uh, of the other uh, elements of, the, of creation on the land. Think about what that means. That table didn't just happen to be there. <laughs> that table was set by people who destroyed the land crushed all the creatures that were there, including our ancestors, and out of their bones built that table and those utensils and take that food and make it so scrumptious, a buffet for all the people who live in this land. That's what that big table is. And to say that we want to seat at that table, there's an instinct there for equality, but think about what it entails in terms of buying into an agenda of a way of being on the land and in relation to the land. And I don't think too many people are thinking about that right now in leadership positions. They're thinking that it's about equality and they might have good instincts in thinking like, why would I want my kids to be second class in terms of material standard of living in a country that's so rich? I have three kids, I don't want them to be second class. I want them to be as healthy, as wealthy, as uh, happy as everybody else but they're forgetting that we live in a colonial country, <laughs> that colonialism is still active, that it's not a level playing field, it's not an ethical relationship to the land that builds these things that Canadians are offering us. It's injustice, it's destruction and environmental destruction, it's all of these things that makes it possible to, for them to offer us inclusion. And at the very least, I think we have the responsibility to point that out to the next generation so that they can make a choice for themselves and not tell them that it's their responsibility to move forward and sit at that table. So that's the essence of what Resurgence is trying to do is to elaborate, um, re elaborate a vision that allows Indigenous youth to think about other options for a healthy way of being, for creating happiness for themselves, for empowering themselves that doesn't mean buying into that lifestyle and that way of being in relation, especially as it relates to the use of the land in this country that Canada is currently involved in. And it's a very difficult thing to do. Very difficult on one hand because you're facing such challenges from the, from the other side, so to speak. Eh? Because not only do they have more lawyers, but they have the, whole, the full weight of the Canadian myth behind them which is that Canada is the best country in the world, right? Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that Canada is the best country. It's the apex of uh, Western civilization. The US, it's all violent. All these other European countries are all corrupt and you know, decaying and all this stuff. But Canada is fresh and new and beautiful and everybody's peaceful and everybody, everybody says uh, sorry. And <laughs> like as if saying sorry for colonialism was enough, eh? It's like, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the best country in the world. That's what the UN says, and that's what everybody's consensus is. But how are you going to confront that, you know? How, how are you going to confront it when you, when you have a youth who's thinking about her future as a bright, smart person graduating from college, wants to do good, wants to, you know, do good for herself and for her community and stuff, and the opportunities are all there laid out. Come sit at the table. Come sit at the table. You know, we'll let you be Aboriginal. You can sing, you can wear your ribbon shirt, you can wear your jingle dress, you can do all that. But as long as you're sitting at the table and you don't disrupt that table, uh, you're good. If you start thinking about moving things around or taking things away or disrupting things or saying things that make it like uh, uncomfortable for people to be eating their fancy food at the table. Okay, enough with the metaphor of the fancy food. I can get carried away here. <laughs> It's the land and it's about the relationship to the land. And so I think that that, is, that itself can be a rhetorical statement. It doesn't really have any meaning in people's lives unless you envision for them ways physically, culturally, psychologically to have that relationship with the land that, that can enable the other two things. The accountability, the, re, the recovery of culture, the transformation, the sustaining of a healthy physical body, of a healthy community that comes from that, and so forth. And so there is really no way to think about resurgence, and I don't think there's any way to think about decolonization 
without thinking about how do we get native youth back on the land. And my whole career, I've thought and said that, and people have variously dismissed it or said that you're a dreamer or you're an idiot or you're an elitist or all kinds of things because oh remember that other thing i said about how people can are very good at rationalizing and deflecting blame this is where that comes in because people know that you can't be indigenous unless you're on the land and that you get just like the the, the earth is our mother there's that old saying and we all say it but what is our mother she doesn't only give birth to us she feeds us and she teaches us among a lot of other things but they sometimes forget that too we all say the earth is our mother okay i get it we all dependent on the earth but your own mother <clears throat> you think about the things that what she's done for you what mothers are supposed to do i should say what mothers are supposed to do is teach you and feed you and raise you and how many of us are living in that relationship with the land today there's not many people that have that opportunity to do that. And in an urban environment, that seems like obvious. Okay, we all live in an urban environment. We're kind of separated from nature and so forth. And so how can we learn about our teachings? How can we really appreciate what the teachings are from our culture if we're not in connection to the land? And so the challenge is obvious there. But uh, my, uh, my kids, their nation is a Wet'suwet'en nation. And for those that, that know Northern BC, their home community is Morristown First Nation, which is in Wet'suwet'en, which is right in beautiful area of north central BC. Um, for a lot of people from our part of the world here, it would seem like the wilderness. It's not really the wilderness to them. And even more so, what shocked me over the 20 years that I've been interacting with that community and learning from them and hunting and, and visiting up there and getting to know them as family, is the fact that even up there in those communities, they are separated from the land. That even being surrounded by vast forests, just a hundred yards or a mile outside of their front door, there's a lot of kids there that don't even know how to hunt. They don't know how to jar fish. They don't know how to do any of that. And that, that was such a shock and so sad to me. Um, mainly because I held such hope that they were like the alternative to our urbanized <laughs> way of living. And then I went up there and I said, so that's when I realized that the connection to the land is really the thing that makes the difference between living as an Nguyenhue and living in this seriously compromised colonized existence where we're not able to pass on our teachings to, our, to the next generation. And so when I thought about putting all of these ideas putting all these ideas into practice, um, of course the first instinct was to begin to put it into practice in the, in the environment that I work in, in the Indigenous Governance Program at the University of Victoria. And maybe I'll leave it to question period to point out uh, some of the people who are from that program and some of the work that they're doing and have done, because there's a number of them here. Um, I thought about putting it into practice, I thought about contrasting it with the work that I'd done previously um, in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. Um, and I thought about a lot of different examples to bring forward and highlight. But one of the main projects that I've been involved in over the last 12 years, I think embodies everything we're talking about. And I've talked about it a number of times now, but it's so like, exciting to me and so motivating and I think so emblematic of everything that we're doing uh, in relation to putting resurgence into practice that I'll talk about it for a few minutes here now to finish off before we open it up. Um, and it's from Aguzasne. So we have a couple of people from Aguzasne here. And uh, it's the Aguzasne um, Cultural Restoration Program. And so in that program, over a number of years, we tried to envision a way to put a resurgence into practice, which is to say, look at the reality that the people in Aguzasne were facing because of the actions of Let's keep it general, capitalism, <laughs> Alcoa. <laughs> Alcoa and the Aluminum Company of America uh, uh, and General Motors. Okay, basically, I'll spare you the long, sad story of their actions in relation to the land and the people of Akwesasne. They polluted the environment in a horrible way with PCBs and it affected mother's milk, it affected the land, it affected everything. And 
these were people that up until recently, in recent history, were still living, you know, in spite of modernization in a fairly intensely traditional way in relation to the land in terms of the practices that were ongoing. My job was to catalog, well, was to document, to examine and document the cultural loss that Alcosasne suffered as a result of pollution. And this was very, very narrowly defined, just the actions of Alcoa and General Motors not the general pollution and changes that resulted from the dam, from the St. Lawrence Seaway, from all other kind of things. Even in that, we found that the, the dispossession of the people from the land didn't only happen by treaty, it happened by pollution. It happened by contamination. And simply the fact, it was simply the fact that people could not relate to the land, draw their sustenance from the land, and maintain a culture that was land-based that resulted in, and we documented this using rigorous social science methods and peer-reviewed studies and all this stuff, to show that their dispossession of the land through pollution and the inability of younger generations to interact with the land and the inability of the elders to, relax, to react through the land in teaching their culture left unfulfilled basic needs in that human community. Elders need to mentor. Elders need to pass on their knowledge. If they don't pass on their knowledge, there's a deep frustration. There's harm. Children need teaching. They need direction. They need purpose. If that doesn't come, there's a deep harm. And so the connection that was broken in that community because of pollution begin to reverberate in many different ways. Everybody's familiar with the social problems, the psychological problems, and the impacts in our communities that manifest in the forms of violence and addictions and so forth, and all these uh, negative psychologies. So in Agusasne, it was pollution, mainly, um, in addition to other things. In other communities, there might be another cause. But what I found was that it was the disconnection from the land in all of those cases that was the essence of it. So whether or not you're up in a northern community and there's a diamond mine that takes away your territory and you can't access that, you can't pass, whether it's that or Agwazasne or any other case, you can't pass on your language because the passing on of language is intimately involved with the practice of medicine gathering and hunting and all that on the territory, which means you can't pass on a worldview, which means you can't pass on an ethical framework for kids to live, and so on and so on. Not only that, you can't teach them how to live healthy. They can't make healthy choices. They have to take the choices that are there in front of them in a capitalist buffet, and they're not healthy, whether it's food or medicines or anything like that. And then also, the strong bonds of interdependency that people had in that hard land-based lifestyle where they were dependent on each other boiling down to very difficult thing to point out in a community but essential to recognize in our framework here of understanding what colonization is the trust in each other is gone and you become a group of individuals who live on a reserve that was the end result of our study a group of individuals living on a reserve versus a nation of people strongly rooted in their territory, accountable to each other, transforming together in relation to challenges, all of these things that I'm talking about, that's all gone. The, the inability of the people to do that is colonization. And how do you confront that? Well, in Aguzasne, our accountability structure, all the, the men and women there who were most affected by it, the people in the community where we had forums like this to talk about it. Uh, their idea was, and it's one that I fully support and have built on in the work that I do, is that just like Rosalie Tizia said, you can talk about all the kinds of compensation, you can talk about healing, you can talk about all of this other stuff, but what we need to do is get our people back in relationship to the land because that's what our teachings tell us is the essence of being Ongwehuwe. We have the Ohanda Gariwa Dekwa, which roots us in a, in a universe, which puts us in a universe of beings in relationship on the land. And we need to start there. And so when we talked about building this program up, the Aguzasne Cultural Restoration Program, which we were successful in getting funding to, to do, which shows that this isn't just pie in the sky, 
you know, for all the naysayers who said, oh, you're dreaming, and this and that. You know, no, we found a way, you know. It's, it's kind of a, it might be a unique opportunity, who knows, but the people in Al-Ghazas, they found a way to make this happen. They took advantage of a legal process that was in place. There was legal action, there was political action, and so forth. In the end, after 12 years, uh, and near failure when General Motors went broke and wasn't able to pay, uh, pulled it out at the last minute. <laughs> there was uh, a package of uh, compensation specifically framed around a cultural restoration program. So the idea about indigenous resurgence now is a reality in al Because what we've done is take this whole framework, language, cultural practice, personal transformation, rebuilding the bonds of trust on the land, transferring culture intergenerationally and all that, and we put it into practice. It's the second year now that it's running. And the people that are involved in that um, are the best examples, I think, of the power of indigenous resurgence as opposed to other avenues of colonization. Um, they're the best example of the, of the decolonizing effect of being indigenous on the land. And all of this, I think, is under the umbrella of what you would call research, because research is really searching for yourself as an ongwe huwe in the midst of all of this confusion and all of these mixed messages and all of this negativity. Where, where are you as an ongwe huwe? Or where are you as a human being with a conscience and a desire to do good and to live in a good way, whether you're ungwe hume or not. Where are you? You have to find that and you have to struggle to find it. And then you have to use these techniques that I've been talking about in this framework I've been talking about in order to build yourself up and to rebuild our communities because everybody knows the world needs it. The world needs indigenous knowledge right now more than ever. We were always told that, that this isn't just knowledge for everybody. Uh, for, for us, it's for everybody. It is for everybody, because look at what's happening. Do I need to use the example of the river in Montreal? No, no I don't even want to see another picture of that river right now, okay? Because it's terrible. And that just to me shows how much education and how much of an example Ongwe Hue need to be to the world when we're talking about confronting the challenges of growth and the challenges of climate change and the challenges of all of these things that we're going forward. So for all of you young people in the university, hopefully I've given you a framework to think about what you're doing and uh, hope you take something good from this and I'll look forward to having a conversation with you right now on, uh, on these ideas or anything else that you want to bring up. All right, now we'll go on.